my best memories from childhood has to do with Yom Kippur, the Jewish Day of Atonement and the holiest day of the year in the Jewish calendar. It was a strict fast from all food and drink, even water. Except that's not how I remember it. I grew up in a secular Jewish home in Russia, but when I was 10, we moved to Israel. There, I was surrounded by many other secular Jewish kids just like me. None of us ever set foot in a synagogue, but Yom Kippur was special nonetheless. You see, for 24 hours every year, something special happened that only happened that one day a year. The streets emptied of all cars. And so, once the sun began going down, marking the beginning of the Day of Atonement, my friends and I would pour out into the streets on our skates and bikes. Helmets optional. Actually, I take it back. No helmets for sure. But it was glorious. The apartment building where we lived was towards the top of a hill, and I would skate down the middle of the street at full speed, knowing that this was the one day each year when no car would appear around the bend at the bottom of the hill. I still do have a scar on my knee, though, to prove that no cars are necessary to wipe out quite spectacularly on the pavement. At least, no teeth were harmed. I worry about that a lot now with my own kids. Anyway, after skating for hours, we would all adjourn to one of my friend's homes to eat cheese sandwiches. Of course, Yom Kippur was a strict fast for the really religious Jews. But you see, we weren't those Jews. Our religion was rather a cultural religion. Yes, we considered our Jewishness to be very important. We were proud to be living in Israel, the Jewish state, the Jewish country. But that awareness of our cultural identity and pride in our country was the extent of our religious belief or observance. As it happens, the idea of cultural religion today is quite common in the US and not just among Jews. More American Catholics are cultural Catholics than observant ones, for instance. And in the American South where I live, cultural Christianity is the air we all breathe. But the point is that cultural religion is not just a modern phenomenon either. And so let me tell you another story. This one's set in the middle of the third century CE. A North African bishop, the equivalent of what we today actually call just a pastor, had to write a sort of uncomfortable document that most pastors would really not like to write. In this treatise, addressing some women in his church, he asked them to stop engaging in some behaviors that everyone else all around them in their very cosmopolitan Roman city took for granted. Specifically, he asked them to refrain from mixed gender public bathing in the nude and from wearing excessive amounts of jewelry and makeup. The treatise seems rather shocking, but there's more. The scandalous nude bathing ladies to whom he was writing were not just regular women in the local church. These were rather single women who had dedicated their virginity to Christ. They were basically nuns, although the term did not yet exist. The many stories like this one of ordinary Christians behaving well badly from the first five centuries of the church can be surprising to us. Such stories challenge the general assumption of the public today that the earliest Christians were zealous converts who were much more counterculturally devoted to their faith than typical churchgoers today. People like me. Also, too often Christians today think of cultural Christianity as a modern concept and one more likely to occur in areas where Christianity is the majority culture. So again, we think of the American Bible Belt. There's a reason we call it the Bible Belt. But the goal of this lecture series is to show you why both of these assumptions are wrong. This series is about Christ cultural Christians, both old and new. But before we go any further, let's consider a definition because this familiar term will keep coming up. So when using the term cultural Christians, I refer to individuals who self-identify as Christians, but whose outward behavior and, to the extent that we can tell, inward thoughts and motivations are largely influenced by the surrounding culture all around them rather than by their Christian faith and the teachings of Jesus Christ. In the Bible Belt, these are often the Christians who may faithfully attend church for an hour most Sundays, but who then kind of compartmentalize their faith the rest of the week. They adopt a variety of modern American culturally normalized behaviors that are antithetical to traditional Christian theological teachings and practices in key areas of life, including attitudes to dating and sexuality, so for instance, cohabiting before marriage or accepting abortion, 
Use of finances, so for example, gambling, or a lack of tithing or compassion for others with their finances. Politics, so for example, we may think of the rise of Christian nationalism. And even church attendance, meaning the belief of those who think that once they've been saved, church attendance is optional. And so there are three related reasons why I'm so passionate about this subject and why I hope you will find it helpful in growing in your own understanding of both the early church and the church today. First, I am a professor of ancient history and have taught for over a dozen years at a state university in a predominantly evangelical region of the American South. I have heard too many of my students and fellow churchgoers over the years make comments about how much better and more devout the early Christians were than we are. In this study, I'll explain both why this view is wrong and also why holding this belief can mislead us in the present. But a second and related reason is that both the American public at large and American Christians in particular have a very limited understanding of ancient history and the world of the early church. Particularly lacking is an accurate understanding of Greco-Roman culture and how this culture shaped people's worldview. And this worldview, in turn, also shaped the sense to which these people were particularly prone. Historian Chris Shannon has described culture in a recent article as secondhand smoke. I think this is a very useful image for us to keep in mind. We breathe it in. But third, if we understand the presence and impact of cultural Christianity in the early church and understand that so many of our own sins are cultural sins, this will have an impact on everything, including our views of finances, marriage and sexuality, politics, and more. Because if so many of us, too, are cultural Christians, just like the cultural Christians in the early church, then trying to fix the world around us through politics or per through particular policies on any given issue will never work. Rather, we need to pursue genuine conversion and sanctification. So, cultural Christianity is the faith of those who are professing Jesus with their words while living by the standards of the surrounding culture rather than the gospel. It is those culturally normalized behaviors of cultural Christians that become, in turn, what I refer to by the term cultural sins. Put simply, cultural Christians commit cultural sins whenever they bypass God's standards to engage in certain culturally conditioned and approved behaviors. These might be so common that the surrounding culture considers them utterly normal, perhaps not even deserving commentary, like the mixed-gender, nude public bathing of the sacred virgins to which Cyprian, the bishop we just mentioned a few minutes ago, objected. Or the modern American attitude towards cohabiting before marriage. And yet, the New Testament presents a countercultural view of such everyday subjects and many others. In the dissonance of the gospel teachings with those of the surrounding culture, we find culturally inspired sins. And focusing on those culturally inspired sins, in turn, allows us to consider which aspects of the surrounding Greco-Roman culture were particularly challenging for early Christians to overcome. And so, we will meet men and women who relied entirely on Greek and Roman ideals of patronage in thinking about how to use their money. We will also meet men who eagerly embraced Christianity but continued to frequent prostitutes in their cosmopolitan city. Again, a practice that was socially and culturally normalized in their world. And we will also meet men and women who were eager for martyrdom at a time of persecution, but who also categorically refused to serve the sick and dying in their community. Finally, while many of the individuals whose stories we will consider were part of the nameless multitudes in the early churches, we will also hear from more familiar voices like Augustine, whose views on Christian nationalism we will consider in a later lecture. What I will present to you is, first and foremost, a historical narrative. And yet, the stories of these believers, men and women from all walks of life and all parts of the Roman Empire from the first five centuries of the Church, provide a fresh and practical perspective as we consider the difficult and timeless questions that stubbornly persist in our own world, in our own churches. How do we resist the views of property, food, gender and sexuality, and self-care that are dominant in the surrounding culture around us? 
Why is Christian nationalism a problem and a cultural sin? And why is running away from the church a solution of cultural Christians? Ultimately, recognizing the cultural sins were always a part of the story of the church and its people is a reminder that we should never idealize the people of the past. Furthermore, for Christian readers in particular, seeing the early church wrestle with the same challenges of cultural Christianity as churches today face should be both a source of comfort and a call to action in pursuit of sanctification in the present. I contend that looking at the stories of these far away and far removed people, the cultural Christians from the ancient world, as strange as they may appear to us at first glance, is a fruitful way to gain better understanding of our own struggles as Christians today. This understanding is ultimately what I would like you to get from this lecture series. But first, a little bit more background. While cultural religion did not look the same in the ancient world as today, it ultimately functioned in similar ways. Cultural religion created identity without demanding excessive personal commitment. The Roman world, with its polytheism and a religion built around the divine protection of the capital of the empire, was a natural environment for cultural religion, as we will see. Because the earliest Christians lived in the Roman Empire, whether they themselves were Romans, Greeks, Jews, or members of the dozens of other groups, the Roman cultural context matters a great deal for understanding the particular sins to which they were prone precisely as a result of their cultural background. And so, before we go further, let us consider in brief what Roman cultural religion looked like. And to do this, we are going to take a little detour and talk about something you probably did not expect to hear about today, chickens. So I'm going to tell you a story now, and it will sound a little bit strange, but you'll see where we're going. The chickens were hungry. Marcus Furius Camillus, recently appointed dictator for the purpose of leading the Roman army in its prolonged war with Vei, stood nearby and watched them with a rising confidence. The chickens never lied in his experience. He knew that this omen could only mean one thing. The pagan gods were about to grant the Romans one of their most important victories yet. Camillus's fa family, one could say, was particularly close to the gods. One of his relatives even served as Pontifex Maximus, head of a powerful priestly college. But more than anything, Rome's cultural religion was part of Camillus's worldview, just as it was for all residents of the Roman Republic. But what exactly does this idea of cultural religion mean, and what did it mean to the Romans? Camillus's own experience offers a glimpse. Sometime around 396 BCE, the Romans, then still largely restricted to a little-known and malaria-ridden village on the Tiber, undertook the siege of Veii, a major Etruscan city located less than 10 miles from Rome, Veii was a significant threat to Rome's safety and growth. As a result, the Senate appointed a dictator, a military office reserved for extreme emergencies and only for six months at a time. And that dictator was Camillus, whose extraordinarily successful previous military record spoke for itself. During the siege, the Romans prayed to their gods for help, as they always did. And indeed, Roman generals were subject to a lot of essential rituals. Violating these rituals, the Romans believed, jeopardized the success of an entire campaign. And for example, the generals had to consult the sacred chickens prior to battle. If the chickens ate the grain that they had been offered, the omens from the gods promised victory. But if the chickens refused to peck at their food, a defeat was sure, so battle had to be postponed for another day. We do hear of Roman generals trying to rig the system a bit. For example, sacred chickens were known to be starved on occasion, so they would eat grain when finally offered, particularly eagerly, providing the desired good omen. But as anyone who has had experience minding chickens knows, they're not the smartest creatures, nor the most predictable. Later on, during the First Punic War, one Roman general, understandably annoyed with the diva chickens disrupting his well-laid battle plans, exclaimed, if they won't eat, let them drink, and threw the chickens in the sea. The chickens promptly drowned, but their predictions proved true. The Romans lost the battle spectacularly. But at 
the siege of Faye, under the leadership of Marcus Furius Camillus, all protocols were followed precisely to the letter. And in addition to the usual religious rituals, such as consulting the chickens, the Romans also performed an evocatio, the ceremonial calling out of a god or goddess of another city or state to come join the Roman side. Specifically in this case, the Romans called out Juno, the patron goddess of Vei, to come join their side, promising her a really nice new temple in Rome in return for her help. The bargain worked. Vei fell to the Romans and, as the Roman historian Livy tells us, a particularly cheeky Roman soldier who was helping to package the cult statue of Juno for transport to her new temple in Rome, asked the statue if she wanted to come to Rome. Juno, to the absolute amazement of all bystanders, nodded her head. Now, this story reveals several key aspects of traditional Roman religion. First, Roman religion was, from its earliest days, as expansionistic and colonizing as Rome itself. As Rome conquered territories increasingly farther removed from the village on the Tiber, it brought in new gods, or new manifestations of known gods, into the state pantheon. But they usually had to be Romanized at least a little bit, so they would fit in. Juno, for instance, was part of Roman religion from its earliest days, but the Vean Juno still had to be welcomed in as a new entity in need of her own new temple. Second, Roman religion was paradoxically both rigid and flexible, and ultimately rooted in bargaining. Certain rituals had to be followed, and the Pax Deorum, peace with the gods, had to be upheld by correct ceremonies. Sure, for most residents of the Roman state, there was significant flexibility in personal religious practice. But in times of crisis, everyone was expected to join in the sacrifices. The complex Roman rituals and the extreme requirements for priests and priesthoods remind us that in the Roman worldview, all transactions with the gods were essentially quid pro quo bargains. It is only in the world of such bargains that the story of Fae and Juno makes perfect sense. And this brings us to the third aspect. Like other ancient polytheistic religions, Roman religion was a quintessentially cultural religion. While today we may think of religion as just one particular aspect of life in our society that can be separated from others, Think, for instance, of the American concept of separation of church and state, again, leaving aside the debate over whether that is exactly what the Establishment Clause of the Constitution means. But this was not the case with other religions in the pre-modern world. So Roman religion was very practical and embedded into every aspect of daily life from birth to death. This cultural religion governed every aspect of what it meant to be a Roman, and so, worshipping the Roman gods was an integral part of being a Roman citizen or resident. Rather than being predicated on a system of theological beliefs or any kind of creed, this polytheistic worship was based around cultural values. The most important of these values was the acceptance of the paramount importance of the city of Rome and, over time, what Rome stood for, the empire. Any individuals who rejected these basic values, as the early Christians did, directly positioned themselves as enemies of Roman society, which is why the Romans saw them as such a threat to the entire social structure. But the Van Juno was willing to play by the Roman rules. Juno's acceptance of the bargain in Vey meant that she was ready to agree to the supremacy of Rome and became Romanized. Given the significance of the city of Rome to Roman cultural religion, it is no coincidence that Constantine, the emperor who moved the capital of the empire from Rome to his own new city, Constantinople, was also the first Christian emperor. Adding insult to injury, he did not even bother asking the sacred chicken's permission. After a thousand years of blessing or threatening Roman generals' battle plans, the chickens were now out of a job. We're now going to say goodbye to the chickens and go back to considering our human witnesses for cultural religion. My point in telling you this story about the nature of Roman religion was to show just how ingrained the idea of connecting religion and culture was in the polytheistic world of the ancient Mediterranean. For Christians, this was indeed the secondhand smoke that they were breathing. 
even as they tried to live on mission by very countercultural standards of their faith. And this is where our story of cultural Christianity begins in earnest. Over the next nine lectures, we will proceed chronologically, focusing on one type of cultural sin at a time, to see how Christians tried and repeatedly failed to resist cultural norms. With each major category of cultural sin that we consider in the early church from the 1st to the 5th century CE, we can identify Greco-Roman cultural attitudes that made that sin possible in the form that we see it take. And what may be one of the most shocking revelations of all is that cultural Christians were present in the church both before and after legalization of Christianity. Adoption of Christianity as the official state religion did not make a difference in the existence of cultural Christians. It only adjusted the form that their cultural sins might take. And so, proceeding in chronological order, we'll tell the story of cultural Christians in the early church one could say from St. Paul to St. Augustine. Using sins as the chief organizing principle for this overall narrative, each lecture focuses on one particular type of cultural sin that stems from specific cultural beliefs. Our aim throughout will be to try and understand the average people in the early churches to the extent that anyone can ever be truly average. And so at this stage, it seems fitting to say a few words about what this study is not. There is no shortage of books that criticize Christianity and Christians, ancient and modern. These resources often bring, bring forth legitimate and deeply rooted sins of individual Christians or entire groups that do cry out for our attention. Evangelical Christians in the 20th and 21st centuries in particular have been subject to significant criticism rooted in exemplary research. To mention just a few examples, the recent books of Kristen Cobel Dume and Beth Allison Barr have brought attention to the culture of toxic masculinity and the resulting mistreatment and disrespect towards women in some evangelical church circles. Likewise, Jamar Tisby and Issa Macaulay have brought much needed attention to the historical and still present sins of systemic racism in the church, including with, within the reformed tradition that has been my own home for seven years now. It may seem at first glance that a study about cultural Christians would fall in the same vein as these other studies about the more recent history of specific types of culturally inspired sins in the church. In certain ways, it probably does. But my aim is not to leave you in utter despair about the state of the church and its people. Furthermore, my goal most certainly is not to motivate anyone to give up and just walk away from Christianity rather than continue fellowshipping with all these hypocrites of whom I'm admittedly one. I am a Reformed Christian and my husband and I have been members of the PCA for seven years now. I found my faith strengthened by the process of preparing this study and I hope that will be the case for you too. So why then give a series of lectures about cultural Christians in the early church? and especially with the express aim of bringing attention to the prominence of these same sins of cultural Christianity in the church today. Can we observe and criticize believers, past and present, in a way that does not merely amount to an exercise in historical gossip and, at its worst, voyeurism, as we look in on examples of painful, culturally inspired sins and ways in which they show the sinful heart of God's people? I speak with the confidence that the answer to this question is yes through these many and varied stories that span the first half millennium of the history of the church, we will see that many early believers were just as eager as Christians today to claim belief in Jesus while continuing to make idols out of their wealth, food, appearance, sexual relationships, and patriotism. Their stories have a historical significance as they allow us to get to know real people who lived and tried to follow Jesus, however imperfectly. Ultimately, their stories and their cultural sins are also deeply relatable in ways that are productively uncomfortable. We may think that we are removed from the world of the early church, but the nature of human sinfulness has not changed. The stories of these early Christians, therefore, are surprisingly familiar and convicting, if only we look closely. While it is at times jarring to admit it, their stories are our stories too.